uh, good morning or good evening, depending on the place and the time zone you are joining us from. And welcome to this event. The time is now a uh, discussion on transitional justice in the United States. My name is Fernando Travesi. I'm the executive director of the International Center for Transitional Justice. And on behalf of ICDJ and our partners for this occasion, the Transitional Justice and Rule of Law Interest Group at the American Society of International Law and the Anti-Black Racism uh, Initiative at the University of Maryland, I want to welcome you all. I also want to welcome and thank Honorable Barbara Lee of the 13th District of California, Dr. Perry and Dr. Ray from Brooklyn's Institution, and my colleagues at ICTJ, Virginie Ladish and Anna Miriam Rocatello, who have uh, co-authored the ICTJ's briefing paper we are launching today, titled The Color of Justice, Transitional Justice and the Legacy of Slavery and Racism in the United States, that you can read and download from our website. You can also read the full bios of our guest speakers in the links that we are sharing in the Q&A section and in the event webpage, and I will not go into them for the interest of time. We are very much looking forward to hearing from all of them on the challenges and opportunities to respond to the growing demand for racial justice and about how optimizing the current window of opportunity to dismantle systemic racism provide redress to those who have suffered and advance reforms to create a national system that does not divide its citizens, but instead set solid grounds for the protections of everyone's rights and equal access to justice for all. In many ways, the last 12 months have been unsettling and unprecedented. And I think we'll probably need some more time and perspective to fully understand the social, political, and economic evolving changes that COVID-19 has brought to our societies. Almost 12 months ago, in the middle of this deadly pandemic that is still affecting all of us in one way or another, we were horrified with the footage of the murder of George Floyd. Sadly, not the first one, and tragically, neither the last one. His name was added to the heartbreaking list of other people of color whose lives have been cut short as a result of a long history of perpetuation of racist policies and behaviors. This time, however, the killing originated a set of national and international protests demanding justice and accountability that compared with previous protest movements, it also seemed very focused on the historical roots of the grievances being voiced and the many different institutional and cultural ways that the country continues perpetuating a system that in practice still discriminates people of color in many pervasive ways. From police brutality and the different standards of treatment by law enforcement institutions towards black Americans to the inequality accessing services and opportunities from African-American communities. No peace without justice is a chant that has filled the streets of the United States last year. The demands for justice were louder and stronger than ever. And the way to respond to them, the level of sympathy and the openness to discuss them divided the country to the edge we all have seen in the last months. Just less than a week ago, former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, was found guilty of murder in George Floyd's death. And some declarations after the verdict emphasized that accountability is not justice. In the transitional justice field, we are very familiar with both statements. No peace without justice, as research shows that systemic impunity is conducive to corruption, authoritarianism, criminality, and the repetition of violations. In fact, they all create a vicious circle, reinforcing each other, allowing the recurrence of the abuses, and the perpetuation of their consequences. And justice is more than accountability, as we know from our, our experience that solving these types of problems requires something far more encompassing than criminal accountability alone. While criminal accountability is an integral and necessary part of their response in some particular cases, delivering justice in these situations entails listening to the voices and demands of victims, it calls for the social acknowledgement of past abuses 
dismantling the structural inequalities and discrimination that allow violations to occur in the first place and carrying out the necessary reforms to prevent the repetition and perpetuation. It involves providing reparations and engage the country in a dialogue towards a future where human rights of all citizens are fully and equally upheld. All the above is what we call transitional justice. And while transitional justice is traditionally associated with countries emerging from war, dictatorship, or authoritarian regimes, and it's often considered as a tool for developing countries in Africa, Asia, or Latin America, the truth is that imperfections and inequalities of our modern societies and the empowerment and awareness of civil society all around the world are increasing the demands for transitional justice processes in well-established democracies in the Western world who have yet to address the legacy of massive human rights violations committed during the darkest period of their past, in some cases, centuries ago, but that are still perpetuating systemic discrimination and inequalities. And yes, there have been many transitional justice processes around the world, further beyond the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, such as Sierra Leone, Argentina, Rwanda, Germany, Chile, South Korea, East Timor, Guatemala. There are ongoing transitional justice processes now in the Gambia, Colombia, and Tunisia, just to name a few on which ICTJ is actively involved. And there is also the demand and the expectation for transitional justice processes to happen in countries where there is still an active conflict, such as Syria, Libya, or Yemen, as victims' demands for justice don't wait until the end of the conflict, and in fact, become even greater as the hostilities continue. But there are also many others that can be considered to inspire this national moment, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, looking at the Canadian Indian residential school system, or even here in the United States, a similar process to examine the forced assimilation of indigenous children in the state of Maine, or the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission, just to name some examples. Even more, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the global protest of Black Lives Matter, Belgium in Europe started to re-examine with transitional justice lens its colonization of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the state of Victoria in Australia is establishing as we speak, a historic truth and justice commission to conduct an inquiry on colonialism, examining historical and present injustices against Aboriginal people, leading towards reforms to address the former ones and to stop and prevent the latter ones. So all these processes are similar in their objectives, but unique within their own context. They all need to be tailored to their specific opportunities and challenges, and they all require strong demand from civil society and genuine political will from state authorities and institutions. Perhaps in the United States, finally, the time is now for taking this conversation into concrete actions that can, that can address and redress the past. Past influences and affects our present and our future as individuals and as a country and as a society. If as William Faulkner said, the past is never dead, is not even past, on her own beautiful words, poet Amanda Gorman recently gave us the perfect continuation for that sentence. Being American is more than a pride we inherit. It is the past we stepped into and how we repair it. Without further delay, I pass the floor to my colleague Emilia Rocatello for our first part of the event to discuss with Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who will have to leave us soon, but to whom we are deeply grateful for being with us in this discussion. And then our other panelists will comment and continue the conversation, also addressing as many questions and comments as possible from the audience. So we encourage you to pose your questions in the Q&A feature. Thank you very much to all of you for your attention and for being with us today. And Emilia, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very, very much, Fernando. And it's a great honor to be here with our panelists and with Congresswoman Woman Lee. Um, it's uh, a particularly 
um, emotional moment for us, for those of us that have worked in the United States, but uh, very marginally on the issues of the United States, but keeping very close uh, to the demands and the struggle of the activists and victims here uh, in, uh, in the States. So um, we, uh, I will first of all, uh, thank again and welcome Congresswoman Lee, uh, with whom we started the program. Uh, and let's try to really make the best use of her uh, very little time that's so precious and that she managed to spend some time, uh, some of it with us. Uh, so I encourage everyone to uh, write questions for um, uh, Congresswoman Lee as of now, so that we can filter them and dedicate a little time also for questions from the audience. But um, having said that, um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, you know, this is also the opportunity for us to share uh, these uh, brief analysis that Virginia and I uh, put together on the uh, relevance of transitional justice to the United States. Uh, and um, you are a, a, the, the original sponsor of this uh, historical uh, resolution that calls for the establishment in the US of a US Commission on Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, which you know, it's a language that resonates very much with us, with those of us that work in this field. And uh, I, uh, am, I was particularly uh, impressed by the formulation of the resolution, a commission to acknowledge, memorialize, uh, the, and eliminate persisting uh, racial inequalities and being a catalyst for progress. So Congresswoman Lee, please tell us uh, what is, uh, what do you think actually, what uh, do you think is the moment, why is the moment now uh, to press forward the establishment of this so important process? Invite me to be with you for a few minutes. And let me thank you, uh, Anna and Virginia, for your analysis. I'm dying to read it because um, this moment should have taken place in 1865. <laughs> and, and for the life of me, I, I want to know why it hasn't taken, mo uh, taken hold uh, since the supposedly end of slavery. Uh, it's just, uh, and listening to Fernando, uh, he set the table, the framework. Uh, and, and I have to <laughs> ask you, what in the heck happened in this country? I mean, we, we've been the, the unfortunate leader in, um, so many crimes against humanity, including genocide of the Native Americans, including, uh, of course, uh, the institute, the government sanctioned legal institution of enslaving Africans from the continent of Africa, we know as slavery. And so <laughs> I, I can't believe that uh, the United States has never come to grips in this way with its past. But Dr. Perry and Dr. Ray, I want to thank you all because you have really given us um, what we need to form this commission in terms of your uh, analysis and your academic perspective and historical perspective and context. And so what, once again, we couldn't do this without you. And uh, transitional justice is an issue that, um, I, I know the civil rights movement, I know, you know, I know our history in this country and this commission to, a truth telling moment in this country as it relates to the crimes against humanity as it relates to slavery has never happened before, even with all of the movements toward justice that we've had in our country. We've made a lot of progress, but I tell you one thing, knowing the historical context in which we live, we have to have this moment of truth telling, racial healing and transformation. Otherwise we're gonna keep getting stuck and tinkering around the edges and never making progress toward dismantling uh, and disrupting the structural issues that are manifested in, for instance, mass incarceration of African-American men and women or the disparities in COVID-19 in terms of the deaths as it relates to black and brown people or the racism in our healthcare system or what the world witnessed with the brutal murder of Mr. Floyd. I mean, we'll never be able to address all of these uh, systemic racist issues 
until we have this truth telling moment in this country. And, and so uh, we started this movement like three or four years ago to put together this commission. Um, but I'm sorry, I didn't start this <laughs> in 1998 when I came to Congress, you know, uh, because uh, we've got a long way to go. And I'm really happy now the rest of the world is seeing what African-Americans have known for 401 years, the weight of the vestiges of the Middle Passage are upon us each and every day. Uh, the trauma is with us each and every day. Uh, people wonder what is taking place in our communities. Uh, all you have to do is look at how black men, black women are disproportionately impacted by um, housing, the wage gap, the wealth gap, the, uh, all of the issues that we know are so real today and, and it can be all traced back to 401 years ago. So it's just uh, shocking to me that we've never addressed it in this way. So this commission, um, we uh, want to move through Congress. I think we have about 130 members now on it and I encourage all of you who are listening and watching to get to your member of Congress and ask them to support HR 19. Uh, it's an extremely important uh, commission. We wrote it into the Democratic Party platform. And we're talking to the Biden-Harris administration, but also in this is the support for reparations, HR 40, they complement each other. And the transformation portion of HR 19 is repairing the damage through reparations. I was sitting in the committee hearing the other night when we finally got HR 40 through a committee markup. I mean, can you imagine this has been 30 years? I mean, it's almost mind boggling. <laughs> that uh, it's taken this long just to get a markup for a commission to study and develop reparations. I mean, what is going on in this country? You know, and so uh, I just had to say that because uh, this moment cannot pass by where in another hundred years, we're still talking about <laughs> the truth. <laughs> we're still talking about healing. And, you know, there are those now who after January 6th are coming and saying, well, we need to heal and move forward. Don't get me to start cussing. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't know my response. So I say, stop it right now. Uh, <laughs> there's no healing at all can take place without truth and without understanding the historical context in which January 6th happened. So bottom line is uh, we've got to get this passed. I really appreciate being with you. Uh, we want to get this set up and we're working with the advocates around HR 40 uh, to get both done, uh, hopefully in the next year or so. That is uh, that is great. And actually you covered a lot of uh, my uh, our curiosities and uh, stress. Another very important aspect for us, which is the complementarity between different processes and therefore the complementarity with the resolution 40. And, but I have, uh, and allow me on the basis of our experience and what we have seen uh, so many times, there is one very uh, important question for us. Uh, and is, you know, in, in our uh, experience, these processes of transformation take time. And I know that victims and, uh, um, have waited far too long, but the establishment of this commission, hopefully very, very soon will celebrate, will be the starting point of, of a much longer painful uh, process. And it is very important to protect the process from the defeat of time the changes in politics, the different uh, societal trends and understanding or misconception that may intervene. So really, I would be very interested in knowing your vision on what can we all do, including Capitol Hill and outside of Capitol Hill, to ensure that wide societal endorsement that would make this process, whatever forms it takes, uh, go forward and really succeed. Sure, and I think uh, that's a very important point and question given the dynamic, the political dynamics in America. And I'm suggesting that local communities form their own commissions as soon as possible, immediately. We've had the Kellogg Foundation Fund. I think there may have been 30, 35 around the country. Dr. Christensen has been uh, a wonderful leader in this effort as Dr. Perry and, and Dr. Ray. Uh, and so the National Commission, of course, will inform, uh, will, will be the National Commission to support local efforts. 
but we've got to get this going at the local level so that it will be systematized and institutionalized and then provide input into the National Commission. And uh, the National Com Commission in many ways is like a civil rights law or like the Voting Rights Act or like any uh, framework for our federal government to ensure that the compliance and the requirements and that it's moving smoothly. But the local level uh, have got to start forming their truth, racial healing and transformation commissions to start beginning to address, for instance, uh, police accountability, funding and, uh, priorities, read uh, structuring cannabis uh, laws, uh, looking at where the systemic issues are in each community and start demanding the local school boards and local uh, city councils and local jurisdictions begin to change their policies and their funding so that uh, we can see at once the National Commission is for formed, uh, what the pitfalls are, how we can strengthen efforts at the local level and what we need to do to really begin to have this national uh, moment of reckoning. And so I think uh, that is a strategy that uh, could work given the political world in which we live in America. Thank you, thank you very much. We have actually an interesting uh, question from the audience, if you uh, permit. Um, they uh, would be um, grateful to receive your views on what do you think will really represent or, or send the strongest political signal that this process will and has to go forward. So what the, the political signal that would allow a meaningful truth telling reconciliation or reparation or other processes of repair and reforms? I think the political signal is, a, is a part of the political process. We have to make sure members of Congress, House and Senate and the White House understand the importance of this. Uh, we have to give them, I mean, your, your analysis is coming out on transitional justice. Every member of Congress should have that. And I'm gonna circulate it. <laughs> But I'm just saying we have to see this as a political struggle and we have to understand that uh, it's, it's about in many ways numbers. I got to get to 218, so does HR 40 in the House to get it passed to the Senate. We have to deal with the filibuster in the Senate. We have to go to different communities in the states and make sure that these members of Congress are educated so that they support it. So we can't separate this out from electoral politics. And we have to know that uh, your political movement, voter registration, voter organizing, beating back these voter suppression laws are all part of allowing this committee the space to move forward and making sure that it happens. But uh, it is just not gonna happen without putting the work in. And uh, I, uh, I'm afraid we'll have just a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so. One uh, question that we were actually pondering um, back in the office is, you know, if and when this resolution passes, keeping all our fingers crossed, there will be in any event a need for implementing legislation to establish the commission, to determine its structure, the way it works, so who will be sitting on it, and so on. And these are actually the technicalities that may make the or break the deal so just mm -hmm. you know maybe you will not be involved maybe you know you will be forever recognized for your incredible <laughs> contribution already made but uh what would be your particular hope uh in order to for this commission to reach and address these large varieties of groups that have been affected yeah. in different ways. By yeah, well, I tend to be involved uh, once we get this passed and start putting the legislation together, because of course it'll be my legislation. And I wanna make sure though, um, that we have the input from you all, for example, the input from advocates, the input from our HR 40 advocates. We need to know how this commission will work uh, based on being informed by what other experiences are. So I'm not willing yet to say how it's going to be formed, what it's going to look like, because I want it to be successful. And that's going to require, and that's why local efforts is so important, that the commissioners, of course, it has to be a broad-based commission, people from all spaces, 
we're going to have to have uh, academics on, researchers. We're going to have to have advocates. We're going to have to have nonprofit represent, you know, representations from the faith community. We have a lot of faith community support, so we're going to have to figure that out. But that's part of the legislative process. And and once we get the resolution, on, and we're talking now to uh, people uh, in in this space about what they think the possibilities would look like. I'm talking to the White House also, and so we're. Uh, sort of uh, imagining it now, but uh, we're going to have to have the, the I'm not going to be the one who's going to say it's got to look like this. We're going to have 10 commissioners or 15 or, you know, and what the mandate is. I'm, I'm going to be informed by what you all think will work because this has got to work. We've got to get past um, this moment of uh, systemic racism and oppression and uh, the weight of 401 years ago and the foot being on every single African-American's neck since the middle passage. So we, we have to do that. Well, thank you uh, very much. I am just looking to my colleagues if there is a very, very uh -huh. last question for Congress. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, now, um, last question for you before you run <laughs> away. <laughs> Are you concerned that the American state will hijack the justice narrative in the US to deflect responsibility given its complicity and indeed perpetration of crimes and racial injustices? Wait a minute, repeat that again now. Yes. Uh, are you concerned that the American state will hijack the justice narrative in the US to deflect the responsibility? We're not gonna let that happen. <laughs> We've been here before. <laughs> right. But okay, uh, we're not gonna let that happen. Um, you know, we're the, our democracy is fragile right now, but it's still holding, it's like holding the line, okay? And uh, we're not gonna let the state um, compromise us nor are we going to let the state uh, really uh, usurp our voices. And we're going to make sure this is a people's effort and continues to be about the people. We're not going to let any government uh, dictate what uh, a commission or what the goals or what the process should be. We'll work with our government. We want to work with them because we want them supportive. But we want this to be a commission and a, and a movement that is going to be successful and uh, not allow any government to take it over. Thank you very, very much for being with us. And okay. we really wish you all the best for your continued endeavor, hoping, of course, all our hopes are with you. And uh, thank you again. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be sure I get a copy of Transitional Justice, your, your uh, analysis, because this is a well, very important document for me to have. Okay, and we'll sure. be, spreading it out. Thanks a lot. Good seeing everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. And uh, now uh, I have the great pleasure to uh, welcome again, uh, Dr. Ray, Dr. Perry, and uh, Ms. Ladish, uh, our, my, my very dear colleague, Virginie, who, uh, with whom we will continue uh, this uh, discussion. First of all, uh, I would like actually to uh, hear your uh, views on uh, uh, something that was touched upon before, which is the reaction to uh, the guilty verdict uh, of Derek Chauvin. The, uh, and the reason why I think all of us were, all of us in ACTJ were particularly striking by it is that in transitional justice, when we start this huge process that touches upon all the layers of societal institutional uh, reforms and redress, the, the, there is a tendency by practitioners and scholars, at least at the international level, to equate justice or transitional justice with criminal accountability. And you have no idea how strongly we fought against it and in to, to really in impress the uh, need to look and frame what justice means in the relevant context. And that in any event, you cannot enact change, even if you were successful in prosecuting a significant numbers of perpetrators, because that doesn't 
offer really doesn't guarantee transformation. So uh, this, uh, this reaction of this is accountability and not justice was for us a revelation. And I, I really would like uh, uh, you uh, to, to offer some of your views and probably, you know, you come from a different obviously experience and you were not surprised at all uh, by it, but we'd be very grateful uh, if you could uh, start up. I don't know, uh, Dr. Perry. Please. I'll, I'll start. Um, first, I, I want to thank ICTJ for in, inviting us um, to this important forum. I also look forward to reading the report um, in depth. Um, but to, it, I, like a lot of African Americans, none of us were really um, celebrating after this decision because um, Derek Chauvin found guilty was just one police officer um, out of <laughs> Um, a countless number of who, who got away and a, a countless number of, of dead and or incarcerated um, black people, brown people in the, in the United States who suffer daily. And we know that that, that was just one modicum of, 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 of um, accountability and not really an a, a accountability for systemic failures that led to um, um, that killing in, in the middle of the street. In addition, you know, um, Rashawn Ray and I come from somewhat different schools. He's done a lot of work in criminal justice and health. I do a lot of work in housing and education. But where we intersect is that mo those systems that undergird those sectors are all stem from a tree of systemic racism. And so until we have um, housing fairness, until we have criminal justice fairness, until we see educational systems that are financed appropriately, until we have health care that reaches all people, we do not have justice. And so we can lock up a lot of people and, and not have those things. So I know not to speak for Rashawn, but we, uh, uh, but I will, <laughs> uh, we are not satisfied until we see um, th those sectors and all the and uh, and and more um, produce the kind of outcomes that cannot predict for race, you know, and so um, that's what I, I think. But I share that uh, that sentiment with millions of African Americans who we may have um, found. Um, some solace in the decision, but we are not satisfied by any means. Yes, I don't know, Ray, if you want to go. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll hop in. I mean, uh, I mean, Andre is exactly right, as always. Um, I mean, again, thank you all for organizing this. This is great. It was great to have um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee um, open up and be able to, to answer questions. She's doing phenomenal work in, in the House and in Congress aiming to, to advance this issue. And I think it's, it's interesting because she, she made some very profound statements, one of which is, where are we at in our country where we can't even have a truth and reconciliation conversation? I mean, like, like what does that mean? I mean, you know, what it, what it speaks to, I remember last uh, February, 2020, right, right before the pandemic started doing its thing, uh, Congressman Akeem Jeffries was at Brookings and he said, uh, that we still have not addressed our genetic birth defect in America, which is systemic racism. I thought that was pretty profound in how it touches to justice. And when we think about Derek Chauvin, the US, US social institutions are interesting. And when it comes to the criminal justice system, part of what happens is that we over-individualize outcomes and we let social institutions off the hook. One of the things that happens with law enforcement is that they are oftentimes the front line of defense and simultaneously the end of the line when it comes to addressing social problems. So they're the front line of defense of systemic racism and state sanctioned violence. Like they are the, 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 the border agents when it comes to dealing with how different bodies are policed. And in America, of course, we have to trace um, law enforcement in the United States back to slave patrols simultaneously they are also the ones who are supposed to address all the social problems that our social institutions 
and our government agencies have failed to do, whether that be uh, behavioral problems in schools, whether that be mental health on our streets, whether that be addressing people who can't make ends meet and pay their rent. What do we do in all those situations? We call 911. And so when you look at a person like Derek Chauvin, who unfortunately, as much as law enforcement tries not to admit this, and, and I think that failed omission is part of the problem why we are where we are today, that Derek Chauvin does represent a, a substantial um, ideal type in law enforcement. Um, and one thing I found in my research is that as much as we talk about these bad apples, this is part of the over-individualization process. Because look, when we talk about the Derek Chauvin verdict, I mean, look, that was a slam dunk. I mean, if there was any case that was supposed to be a slam dunk, it was this one. But you know what happened? All of us sat around, we saw the slam dunk, or you know, in the European context, we saw the ball go into the soccer net. And then everybody looked at the scoreboard to see if it was going to count. See, it wasn't just that we saw it happen. It was whether or not there was going to be some level of accountability or justice, however we want to frame that semantically, right? And so when we talk about these bad apples, um, they come from somewhere and they come from rotten trees in law enforcement. And the thing I found in my research is that good apples, good apples don't simply combat bad apples. Good apples become poisoned and stained through their affiliation with bad apples. And that's why we have to focus on the systemic issues. No, I, I can't agree more. Actually, this is really the, um, there is actually a trend now that I'm sure you are uh, very familiar with in criminology that is really questioning hard uh, this assumption that uh, misbehavior from or even commission of crimes from uh, state representatives or public officials uh, is always to be uh, you know, it is just a deviation, an individual deviation to a system, while in reality, deviations are allowed, if not encouraged, if not structurally enabled. And therefore, um, you know, it's a very different way of uh, understanding the problem and therefore trying to find uh, some uh, solutions. In this regard, I think that our paper actually um, uh, goes along the same lines. And um, th there is one uh, thing that I was also in, you know, that gave me hope in the criminal proceedings, um, which was the testimony of uh, the other police officers. And uh, uh, because in, in, you know, in our experience, these processes always require that what we call the critical mass of of the society that wishes to change, that doesn't want to be part of this deep injustice. So now I don't want to, you know, uh, read too much into, into that, but certainly you would not be able to dismantle any structural problem if parts of it, representatives of it, do not, you know, take the distance and denounce and fight it, uh, even though they may in principle be part of that category that benefits from uh, the injustice. Um, I, I don't know, Virginie, what, uh, what, the, what did you think about, what, what is your reflection about the? Yeah, I, mean, I think I you know, second everything that's already been said that, um, and I think the framing of transitional justice can be helpful in, in thinking more comprehensively about what justice entails. And I think building on what Roshan and Angie already, already said, I think adding also the need for not just looking at the system, so beyond individuals looking at the system, but also thinking about how do we then concretely provide some sort of repair and adjust to those who were harmed. So I always think back to a Mayan woman that I interviewed in Guatemala who had suffered through the Civil War, and uh, her husband had been murdered in a massacre committed by the military, and that general in charge for that massacre was in jail, and we asked her, so do you feel that you've achieved justice? And her response was like, I'm here in this adobe hut. He's in a prison cell with cinder blocks with a television, regular meals and family visits. How is that justice? And I think that just, you know, really portrays so well that it's a multifaceted harm, multi-generational, really complex and requires equally complex multifaceted response that addresses the systems and then those who were harmed and then reforms prevent the future recurrence of such violations. 
Thank you. Thank you, Virginie. Actually, you touched upon the other critical issue here that we would like to, dis uh, to discuss, which is the reparation, you know, a fundamental element of any transitional justice process, a fundamental element of justice, repair. And I know that both Dr. Ray and Dr. Perry have written extensively about this issue. Um, and now that there seem to be two different, um, or at least we have identified two uh, different connected um, arguments about the concept of reparations for the legacy of slavery in the United States. In one uh, uh, issue, one um, area, um, there seem to be a, uh, an understanding or at least a, a, a position whereby uh, reparation should take the form in the US of equity initiatives. That reparation doesn't have sense, you know, in the, 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 the traditional concept of reparation of doesn't really make sense because so long have passed, because the issues have transformed into different forms of discrimination. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, what, what we need is more equity initiatives. But there is a significant difference. And so I would like both of you, if you, if you um, can, just to tell us what, in your views, are the main differences and why equity initiatives may not be sufficient or adequate to address what we are trying to achieve? You want to go, uh, Rashawn, first this time? Uh, sure, I, I'll go first. I mean, look, the, the thing about equity is this. Equity really only works if we're assuming that we're starting on a level playing field. You know, that that's the only way... Uh, equity only works. Instead, equity moving forward doesn't address anything about the past that also impacts the present. You know, there was actually a conservative um, columnist that wrote, I think it was in Washington Post or New York Times over the weekend, yeah. who was talking about why he supports reparations. And it was this exact point. He said, at the heart of conservatism, it is that people can start from the same point and be able to pull themselves up from their own bootstraps with equitable access to resources. Well, you know what? That only works if we address what's happened before. And so yes, equity approaches are really important, but one thing that distinguishes thinking about reparations and the importance of a truth and reconciliation process is recognizing how the past impacts the present. And I know not only thinking about the legacy of slavery and the fact that there was an opportunity for black people to receive some symbionts of, uh, of reparations with the 40 acres and a mule and that didn't happen. Not only is it about thinking through the, 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 the great new deal, the new deal and how black people were left out of the GI bill, how they were left out of social security, how we were left out of um, a various sorts of initiatives that created the middle class today, which, which really at that time was really creating the white middle class that existed then. And then of course, we have to talk about the continuous ways that inequality manifests, not only during COVID dealing with health, but also thinking <clears> through <throat> the fact that when it came to uh, payment protection program funding from the Small Business Administration, that Black people, Latino-owned businesses, women-owned businesses were largely left out in the cold. So equity, of course, is really, really important, but it only works if we deal with the past. And then, of course, there are other ways to think about the nuances, right? I mean, and I know we'll get we'll get to this, but I mean, one way to think about it is um, wealth building strategies, which Andre and I have have advocated for and advanced for, um, as well as say direct cash payments. When we start talking about how you address the wrong, I don't really think it's an or. It's probably more like an and. And oftentimes, when we talk about anything for Black people, it's always an or. It's always shortchanging. And the, the final point I'll make around the equity initiatives is, you know, it's a growing sentiment in the Black community. And I, I think it's always been there, but I, th I think it's growing that, um, that oftentimes when racial progress is being pursued for Black people, oftentimes uh, issues that specifically relate to Black people get further pushed down the line um, for other efforts. 
efforts that that are extremely important, but it is something to look at historically that that is something that has happened. As an example, affirmative action, which was put in place, not really to correct past wrongs, but to create equity moving forward, while of course it's benefited racial and ethnic minority groups, black people included, it's, it's definitely helped with gender inequality in a way that, that people maybe thought deliberately about, but maybe not. And so these are the various ways that we might think about equity is, is complicated, but we have to address the past in order to ensure that equity initiatives moving forward allow everyone to have the same opportunities. Yeah, you know, and I'll um, co-sign all of that. The only thing I'll add is, um, and also we'll co-sign uh, Virginie's um, excellent example of the young woman who um, did not receive justice um, because of the living condition or evidenced by the, the living condition. Um, um, one of the first um, policies that President Biden issued, one of the executive orders um, when he came into office was one on, to advance racial equity. Um, and when you read that document, it's really defined as equality or fairness by law. And what's um, peculiar about that executive order is that you can create laws that are fair and not repair the damage that has been done by past law. And so at some point you need, if you really do want a level playing field, if you really want people to have an equal chance, you have got to distribute resources based upon the damage. Now they can come in many forms and they should because the damage came in many different ways. But the point being is that equity is not just a matter of fairness. It's a matter about a matter of repair. And you can't have um, um, equity, fairness, and um, any kind of sense of justice without some repair. And actually, this is um, this is what makes the difference to us. You know that reparation is based on acknowledgement. So yes. certainly, equity or other social policies to um, level the field are very important. But uh, it's uh, the recognition of what was uh, what has been done and the wrongness of it. It's uh, it's key. And so, uh, and, and here we come to the other, uh, the, the other uh, debate that is surrounding now reparations uh, these days that I mentioned before. Um, many uh, seem to resist against uh, a, an idea of material reparations and you know, individual reparations and so on. In our analysis, we offer some ideas on how many, in, in how many different ways you can actually develop reparations uh, and the reparation program. But uh, from the two of you, actually, what uh, would you uh, envisage? What uh, do you think uh, would be uh, meaningful? Well, um, I would challenge one of the assumptions that you said. We, in the United States, we actually believe in reparations, but we just don't believe in reparations for Black people. Throughout <laughs> history, <laughs> we've seen um, time and time again, well, actually other ethnic groups receiving some forms of reparations, but understand as, as um, Rashawn Ray mentioned, um, a few weeks after mandates came from the um, state governments and the federal government to socially distance and to shut down businesses and schools, it was the business community that shouted, we need to be made um, whole, we need repair and the federal government responded, but they responded in a way that shut out 95% of black businesses. Now, um, and again, so my I brought that up just to say, we actually do re believe in reparations, but we don't believe in it for black people. And, and, and it could, time and time again, we have to repeat this. Um, um, individuals are not paying reparations. The federal government is paying reparations. The state government is paying reparations. City government um, is paying reparations. 
Um, just as we share, um, I, you know, I haven't been to Yellowstone Park, but I paid taxes to go towards it. Um, you know, th th that this idea that, you, that a direct benefit should come from usage or, or something like that, th that doesn't make any sense. Um, we, um, we should have some form of reparations. Now, as um, my colleague and I talked about in our um, um, Washington Post op that Evanston's grants to black homeowners aren't enough, but they are reparations. We support multiple forms of reparations and they can come um, in the form of educational grants, business grants, um, um, cash payments, you name it. Uh, but but it, because again, the damage was inflicted in multiple levels. And if each party is going to acknowledge the damage, then you should see the repair coming from all those different um, systems. So, um, I mean, we can, we can go into de detail what they can look like, but the, the point of the matter is that reparations is, is multifaceted. Um, it should come from multiple levels um, and um, in, in many different forms. Uh, and, but this, isn't, this is not new to the US. It's just new to black people. And so that, I, I'll, just, I'll leave it there. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, Andre said it all. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where when we start talking about reparations and what they could look like, and of course, you know, there are other scholars who have advocated only for direct cash payments. We think, we think direct ca cash payments are in order, but we also think um, dealing with the social institutions, as Andre was talking about, is important. And let me tell you why. Because everyone from the federal government to state agencies to municipalities, to universities and colleges, to corporate America have all played a role in black racism, discrimination and relegation and all should atone for that. All have a role to play. So when we look at Evanston, for example, what they did is by textbook definition of what reparations should look like. The wrong was redlining. The wrong was housing segregation. So they said, if you were impacted from this year to that year, you will qualify for this program because you were disproportionately impacted and discriminated against. Now, as Andre was saying, I mean, we can get into all the details about whether or not it was enough money and you know whether or not they should have used what they did and whether or not, I mean, and, and we went through all those things and we have those same critiques, but you know what? Um, as Andre said, he said something extremely profound, which was America is not opposed to reparations they're just opposed to reparations for black people. Like, I mean, we have to be clear that Native Americans and um, Japanese Americans who were interned and also even the United States playing a role in ensuring that uh, Jews who were impacted by the Holocaust continue to receive payments, including their relatives. So that's, that's one of the critiques people have. People are like, well, nobody was alive then. You know what? Um, we're starting to get to that point when it comes to the Holocaust during World War II and yet and still those payments continue. So it's interesting, the only group that we're really talking about that hasn't been able to get their due is the group in the American context that has been one of the most disenfranchised when it comes to thinking about slavery. And again, not just slavery, but thinking about Jim Crow segregation and thinking about the continuation of things that have happened to, to this date. And so social institutions have a role to play. Evanston's example is, is one good example. Universities are starting to do this as well. So for example, we, we, we have Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, we obviously have Georgetown, but then we also have the state of Virginia, which is I think a really good example because the state has ordered their universities to determine the role they played in enslavement and to correct for that. So this is a good example of the state helping to lead the way to work with universities, two institutions. And we gotta think, this is Virginia. I mean, this is the state, one of the states that started all this stuff and other states need to get in line, including Maryland 
and not not just states around the south there were states on the east coast that played a role new york city was one of the biggest imports of slaves and then they would bring people in and then they would ship them south and they currently have an african burial ground where when they were trying to build government buildings fbi and cia and the like they found that the land was perky it was really fertile and what they found underneath that were a whole bunch of bones bones of african slaves that were on that land so look it's not just about the federal government that is the biggest debt to pay but there are others that also have a role to play to address things in this process. And I think that the more examples and in innovation we have, because that's the thing about the Evanston model, we can critique it. And the first thing is always gonna be critiqued. Something that's innovative can always be critiqued, but it's an innovative program. And I think it's something that other municipalities, states need to look at. Are there limitations? There are huge limitations. But you know what they said? We're not going to wait until we get it perfect because that's the other thing Black people always hear. Oh, we can't do anything until we get things perfect. Well, when is that going to be? Because America's never been perfect for us. So waiting around for perfection is th something that Black people have been accustomed to. And so that's one of those things where we just need to get moving. And I think it starts with the Truth and Reconciliation Bill by Congresswoman Lee. It starts with H.R. 40. Uh, continuing to be pushed by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. And, you know, the Senate needs to get on board with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like now to uh, go back actually to um, truth seeking and the commission. Uh, Virginia, we have seen our good share of truth commissions around the globe. Um, can you uh, just tell us uh, what do you think are the critical elements for a good? Uh, for, for the success of such a, a process and more importantly, what you think would be important in the US? Yes, thank you. I mean, I think, um, you know, the first thing to say when we're thinking about truth commissions and reparations, all these elements of transitional justice is that the process is essential. And the process is a chance for you to mirror the types of social interactions that you want to see moving forward. It's a chance for you to start to demonstrate the respect of others, the rights that you want to sort of emulate within society. So I think when we're thinking about a truth-seeking process or a reparations commission, uh, the first thing is to make sure that it's open, transparent, and involves, actively involves the citizens that it's meant to benefit. And so one thing I would push for us to think about in the context of the US is as commissions are established either at the federal, state, or city level, that we think about how from the very beginning um, to inculcate those values that we're trying to bring to our society. So the first is, you know, in designing the mandate and in selecting the commissioners. So, so far, many of the commissions that we're dealing with in the US have commissioners being appointed by the governor, by the president. And oftentimes they're, you know, within certain institutions and they're still doing their job and this commission job. And I think that's a real challenge um, to do both of those things well. If we look at international cases of truth commissions, generally, I mean, of course, there's all models, you know, you can learn from good examples and bad examples, but from good examples, for example, in the process in, in Colombia right now and what's being launched in Australia in the state of Victoria, there's an open um, selection process. So an independent committee of um, respected independent people were selected to oversee the selection process, inviting applications from all across the country and sometimes the diaspora, then shortlisting publicly the candidates. So the public has a chance to read the profiles of those who've been selected or pre-selected there's a moment for public comment. In the case of Colombia, the interviews were even held publicly. And then the commissioners are appointed. So rather than have you know, a decree or executive order appoint commissioners who have this huge task to undertake, from the beginning, involve the broader public to weigh in on what type of commissioner do we need? What type of um, skill sets do we need? And, and also making sure that these commissioners are accountable and legitimate in the eyes of those who you're trying to, to benefit. So I think we saw in Cote d'Ivoire, there was, you know, the president appointed the 10 commissioners, 
They were all elites from the capital. And unfortunately, that Truth Commission failed to, to really resonate with the needs and the demands of victims and really lead to transformative change. So I think in the US, we want to avoid that and again, try and be as open and participatory from, from the very beginning. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I'll, um, I have a, 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 another uh, couple of questions for all of you, but uh, there are very interesting questions coming from the audience. So if you allow me, I'll, I'll just integrate a few of those. Um, there is actually one question, a very difficult question, but it will allow us to unpack a little bit what the truth-seeking process uh, entails, hopefully. Um, so uh, we are being asked how should the process of truth telling address the ways white people specifically have benefited from these, uh, the, the racist system and, uh, and the control and oppression that it exercised? And how should white people be held accountable going forward? Yeah, yeah I'll take that because yeah. I think um, in um, Virginia is probably more um, knowledgeable, certainly more knowledgeable about um, truth-seeking commissions across the country. But what I appreciate about them is that if you have them without having a true reparations program or a justice program, they fall flat. And in America, um, white Americans in particular are, are actually um, becoming much more comfortable apologizing for things, but not repairing things. <laughs> um, and so we also must, you know, certainly the process is needed, but we should not um, seek truth in, in exchange for justice and reparations, clear, clearly. I mean, I would rather much, have the, much rather have the latter. I, I actually do think you need truth um, seeking, truth telling, but in the United States, um, you always see now a famous person, it can be a celebrity, a congressperson, say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry, I would like to move on. But they never, undo, never acknowledge or reckon with the damage that is caused. And, and so, and I, and I think there was a little bit of that in South Africa and in other places, but um, the point being, you need all of it to really have a successful um, effort to um, get to justice. But let's not kid ourselves that people are now um, um, disingenuously um, um, speaking truth or acknowledging damage without <laughs> um, any real um, sincere effort to repair. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think about, I mean, look, it's, it, it almost seems so simple. Just, let's just tell the truth. You know, in America, um, there's this perception, and I think in other parts of the world as well, but since, since we talk specifically about the United States, that that some sort of way there are these multiple truths. And no, it's it's not like it, it's it's what ha it's what actually happened, and you know, and I think it, it starts with one of the places where you know one of the main social institutions that Andre studies, which is education. I mean, if you look in places like like for example, if you look at what Hannah Jones's 1619 project, how how people responded to that with a level of anger and visceral reaction to simply telling the truth about how our country was founded. I mean, you know, part of what happens and, and it speaks to education. Why is that? Because you know what? In, a, in some states around the country, Texas is one. They don't even use the word slave or enslavement um, in certain textbooks. So students are in social studies, right? Which is what we call history, but it's, it's social studies in the US context they're not even learning the truth. So you know what happens? There's then a segment of the population that comes to college. They interact with people like me and Andre as professors. And for the first time, they're 18, 19, 20 years old. They're hearing this for the first time and their mind is blown. And they're trying to figure out what to do with this information they've never heard before. So part of thinking about a truth and reconciliation process on the truth telling part is it has to start very, very young. And as we're in this next phase of a racial awakening, 
you know, the, the last big one was the 1950s and 60s, really the 60s was when, you know, white people in particular started saying, oh, shoot, you know, for the past like half century, black people been living separate for us and it hasn't been equal. Like, you know, they, they have this realization, like, like they didn't know it. They didn't know it because they didn't want to want to admit it and know it. But one of the things I always talk about quickly is, is a typology that I use. The first starts with being what I call a racial equity learner. That's what people are doing today. They're learning. So part of a truth telling experience is, is first learning, being willing to learn. It doesn't matter if you're five or it doesn't matter if you're 50, being open to that process. The second is after you learn it, you then have to become what I call a racial equity advocate, right? That, that moves beyond allyship because see, you can be an ally and be silent, right? It's a lot of men who are allies to women, but then when their friends crack a joke or someone does something inappropriately sexually, it's oftentimes illegal and criminal. They're silent about those things. They don't intervene. The same thing happens with race. And oftentimes it's white people who are silent about the race. It's they're sitting around at their own dinner tables with their own friends, their own family members, sitting around with their coworkers. And what they're doing at that point is they're silent about things that they know are wrong. Those are the moments that start to change things, particularly because you have young people who are listening to those conversations, trying to see if someone is gonna speak up and speak out. So part of being a racial equity advocate is speaking up for people who are not sitting at a table um, who need to be represented. I, I learned this very, very well when I was spending time in Europe teaching at the University of Mannheim in Germany. And I would go to dinner with, with Germans and they would start talking about different parts of the city and different places not to go and what I shouldn't do. And I was like, I was just over there yesterday. Like, what's, there's nothing wrong with the area. And I started realizing that they were talking about Turkish people. Why I shouldn't hang out with them? Why I shouldn't go around them? Why I should be scared of them? And I remember one way, one time on our way back to our flats, I was telling my wife, I said, I'm pretty sure that's how white people talk about black people in America. But you know what? Since we're black, we never hear it. But other white people do. And they oftentimes choose to be silent about it. And so part of the truth telling experience is being a racial equity advocate and then being a racial equity broker to really start to change the rules, regulations, policies, and procedures that are in place that maintain the inequality, that they recognize that it's not just about moving forward, but it's about addressing the past. And we all have a lot to learn, but only by being open to it can we properly go through the process. Yeah, I think building on all the points that both Andre and Rashan just made, I think in the United States, given that the legacy of harm is multi-generational, so systemic, and removed from this current moment, in some cases, other cases is more recent, past truth commissions that were dealing with more immediate harms, you know, had a more clear victim perpetrator category. But I think in the United States, we really need to rethink those categories. And they're never so simplistic or it's neither you're either a victim or a perpetrator. But I think the United States poses um, a question and, and here we need to sort of do better than what they did in South Africa and or in our neighbor of Canada. How do you think about the, the communities that benefited from the system of white supremacy? And, and so even if, you know, I'm not directly involved, I benefit from that system. So what is my responsibility? But I think it's, it's really critical to think about how do we center the responsibility of these beneficiary communities without then overtaking the process. And I think that's also really important. So I think there's a lot of reflection that the white community in the United States needs to do to think about, you know, there's an, there's already, this truth is already out there. It hasn't been acknowledged and it hasn't changed our approaches. So what do we do as a result of this truth? What does this truth listening lead to in terms of concrete changes in our society, in our laws, what we're willing to pay our taxes for, including reparations? And then I think they're, you know, really, so expanding these categories of victim and perpetrator, looking at beneficiary communities, harmed communities, and, and really centering that the need to take responsibility. And I think, um, you know, after the, the tragic death of Makia Bryant the other day, the mayor of Columbus, he said, you know, how did we get here? Some are guilty, but all of us are responsible. And I think, you know, thinking about what is that responsibility? And it's, you know, to your point, Rashawn, it's not some bad apples, it's the rotten tree and we're all on that tree um, in different degrees. But for the white community, what is our responsibility? Um, so I think, 
you know, we have also to look to what's going to, what's starting to take place in Victoria, Australia, where they're uh, launching the Truth and Justice Commission that will look at 250 years, of, close to 250 years of colonial um, aggression against Aboriginal people. How are they going to involve the settler community? How has Canada done so? And what can we learn in the United States to make sure that, as you say, it's not a superficial, okay, we listen to the truth, we say, I'm sorry, and we move on. It's not about turning the page on the past. It's really examining it and how do we undo the past's harms in the present and in the future. You know, I'm, can I just add a, a few things on this? Because many of the um, um, truth and justice um, commissions of, of the past um, was still about the willingness of white elites to tell the truth. Power is shifting. <laughs> And truth is coming to America, whether white people or white elites want it or not. Um, and so th 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 there needs to be something different because truth is coming. Truth is here in so many different ways. And uh, Virginia really uh, ad ad partially addressed this is that um, um, what do you do with the truth is is next and and as power is starting to be shared by no means am I saying black people are in power but we are in a different place in terms of power gains as we were 20 years ago 40 years ago 60 years ago and as that power increases you know white elites won't have the ability to just say, oh, I'm going to reckon with it in my way. <laughs> you know, and so all around the world, power is shifting. So this conversation around truth and reconciliation is also going to shift. So it'll be interesting how this takes shape um, as we move along. Yeah, I mean, I'm Look, I'm I'm over here taking notes as you and you and Virginia are talking. I'm uh you all have some some profound statements. And as you're talking about this, see, part of what happens when power shifts is that people perceive power as um, a water bottle. Like, like there's only so much power to go in instead of an endless ocean, which is the way I think about it. Like just simply everyone having the ability to be autonomous, to be agentic, to have equity. And when we think through that, part of what um, pretty much all white people realize, whether they're native born or not, whether they're in the US or not, because of course, in an international context, whether we're talking about enslavement or whether we're talking about colonization, there is a power differential. And whether you're white or black, you feel it when you go into certain spaces, when you go to certain, when you go to different countries, when you go to different cities, when you go into different boardrooms, you feel the power shift. And for white people who have always had power, that shift is very uncomfortable. And that's because when equity is being pursued, the people who have benefited the most from it perceive they have the most to lose. But it's, it's deeper than that. It's really that when equity is being was when equity is being pursued, people who have benefited from the inequality will oftentimes fight tooth and nail to preserve it. And other people, even if they're not fighting tooth and nail to preserve it, part of what they do is they become silent and ambivalent because they realize their silence creates someone else's oppression so that they can maintain the privilege that they're worried about giving up. And that's because when we talk about whiteness, whiteness isn't simply economic. This is why we talk about truth and reconciliation is so important because it's not just economic, it's also social and cultural. And as Lyndon Johnson said, when he was president, and he was talking about affirmative action, he was talking about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act. He said, if you can convince the lowest white man that he's better than the best black man, you can pick his pocket and he won't even know that you've done it. So as we pursue truth, there could be alliances and allegiances across racial groups by class that can really advance this. This is the reason why someone like Fred Hampton, the Black Panther who was killed, that Daniel Kaluuya just won an Academy Award for last night. This is why he was so threatening. He wasn't a Black separatist. He was for a rainbow coalition, right, that, that Jesse Jackson took up and ended up running with. And so as we think through these things, when we talk about truth and reconciliation, 
people realize that it's not simply economic. That is a very limited lens by which we've looked at society. And then we start to admit that racism was created because oftentimes the social construction of race, which helped to maintain the, uh, or, or helped to really bolster um, the, the perceived genetics and the pseudoscience of racial difference has led to the exploitation of race for economic gains. And, it, and people realize, and Virginia, you said it so well, you made a statement. I, I wrote down the exact words you said. It was so, it was so good. You said, we are all in the tree to different degrees. That was so profound because what you're saying is we're all complicit. You know, we all have a role to play and we're all part of the rotten tree to different degrees. And, you know, of course, oftentimes when people think about we're talking about truth and reconciliation, we're talking about hearts and minds. But as Andre was saying, there's another economic part. There's another structural part, because when we look at history, the legislations I just mentioned from the 1960s, white people were overwhelmingly opposed to those. Like I tell people all the time, as much as we like to highlight Martin Luther King Jr. And, and we liberals, conservatives alike, if people don't support Black Lives Matter, if they think that Derek Chauvin should have gotten off, they would have hated MLK. They would have hated him. They would have cheered when he got assassinated, which happened to be in Memphis where I went to college at. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of time at the Lorraine Motel um, growing up. And so, so when we think about this process, we have to be very clear that structural change and policy change should not come at the expense of waiting for people to get their own minds and hearts in order, that we need to have the policy change that can lead people to that and more so hold people accountable if they don't want to fall in line with what should be an equitable process for people. Thank you so yes. much. I think for, for recenting us, I think that the question about class and economics in this discussion, because you're right, it's so fundamental to, to the whole system in the United States. And just on the, the topic of accountability, I just want to share very briefly one source of inspiration from an initiative that's going on right now in the United States in Alaska, the first Alaskans uh, Institute is holding a, a national or yes, a locally level uh, truth racial healing transformation process. And they came up with the term accountability partners where they invite people from the institutions that have perpetrated policies against first Alaskans, invite them to listen. And they have to sign a contract saying that they're there to listen and that by showing up for this public hearing, they first acknowledge these certain basic truths to be fact. And then after they've listened to the truth, think about a response, a policy level response to repair and prevent that harm from happening again. So for example, the fishing industry about permitting or, and I just thought that that was such a brilliant way of, of you know, it's a, it's a process led by the first Alaskans Institute and, and Alaskan, uh, Native Alaskans, but they're bringing in those who are responsible to listen and then respond and do something about that truth. So that's one idea that we can also learn from that's ongoing right now. And, um, and this is deeply connected with what you, you all mentioned, which is uh, you know, reconciliation, the ultimate goal that we, in transitional justice, is expected. Um, reconciliation is actually a term that causes a lot of dilemmas for those of us that work in this field. And um, actually, uh, it's... Uh, how do you know we debated a lot congresswoman only mentioned you know also reconciliation but uh what would um what would bring reconciliation how do we really hope reconciliation to be uh and uh, and is that an objective of the different process that we are trying to um establish um, in your views? Well, I, you know, reconciliation becomes a lot easier when people have wealth, when people have housing, when people have education. You'd be amazed when people have resources, how, uh, how quickly others start to reconcile. When people have power, how quickly they begin to say, oh, I understand now. I think reconciliation is always difficult when there's a power imbalance. And so um, for me, it's about 
you know, not to put one before the other, but to just understand the goal is to make sure that we eradicate the, um, these drags of racism in our housing markets, in our criminal justice system, in our educational system, um, in our health system, um, and, and, and make sure that people can get adequate pay, adequate benefits um, on all the things that are commensurate with a decent life. And when that happens, oh, people start to wake up. <laughs> and to see, oh, I'm you. I have to look you directly in the eye now. I have to see you as an equal, because it, it just like everything else, um, people can throw stones and hide their hand from up high all the time. But when you have to see someone directly in the eye as equals, you you begin to tone down your language. You begin to tone down. Um, your policy, you begin to tone down your beliefs. So for me, um, reconciliation is wanted because certainly we don't, we can't keep going at this pace where we are, uh, where we are being killed, and and there's a response. We meaning black folk, but um, when we um, get some level of justice, a decent level of justice again talking about health, education, housing, criminal justice, all those different things, a systemic level. I, I am, I, you know, I'm pretty sure we'll start to see people reconcile a, lo a lot quicker. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, when we talk about reconciliation, um, again, people perceive that they always have something to give up. And, and oftentimes there, there are things to, to give up, um, but they're not always economic. They're, they're also social and cultural aspects. Um, as a Southerner and for people in the South, it's also giving up a nostalgic history that's simply false. For example, um, there are tons of Confederate statues, Confederate flags that fly around the South and now starting to be around uh, other parts of the country. What most people don't realize is that those Confederate flags and statues didn't really become popular after the Civil War as a way to acknowledge the South. Came about for a couple of reasons. First, because the South lost and then was actually able to win by having property be returned, by having money be returned for um, for, for, for losing property as in slaves. That's what happened in Washington, D.C. And then also it was about being able to control the South and having um, a legacy that, that was redone, being able to, to create convict leasing, uh, which was simply a, a, another way to a form, a form of second slavery. It was also then, of course, at the height of the civil rights movement was the time period that we saw the most Confederate statues go up. Most people in America actually don't know that truth. It completely changes how we think about Confederate flags and statues. And so part of it when, and of course, we, I mean, military bases as well. I mean, you know, it's schools being named after Confederates um, and, and not just Confederates at that, because see, we, we have to be very specific about the language. Oftentimes staunch white supremacists, right? Members of the KKK, like Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, I remember arguing with a friend from school and I was like, Nathan Bedford Forrest like helped found the KKK. I don't know how you can how you can spin that and make him a good person. But but see, this is the thing about America. And this is where W.B. Du Bois's double consciousness as we think about truth setting and what we learn is so important is that and, and policing does this as well. People are going to have interactions with the same thing or the same person and have significantly different experiences. So trying to oftentimes tell white people, whether that be low income, poor white people with, with a lower level of education who, who might have an incentive for drawing upon the social and cultural capital that they've gained from whiteness, or even elite white people with very high incomes and high levels of education who oftentimes silence helps them to maintain the status quo that at the same time, Black people could have interactions with policing, with education, 
with employment and interact with the same person in the same system and have a completely different experience. And a lot of white people understand that, whether or not they want to fully admit that or not. And I think these are this is part of the truth that we have to get to, not just about what's happened, but the impact that it has on people's health, the impact it has on people's minds, the impact it has on people's souls. And so part of reconciling our country is to realize that it was founded to never be equitable. Like, like, like our country was founded to never be equitable. So in order to pursue something that we consider to be equitable, it does mean a complete transformation of what has, what has transpired over the past uh, few centuries. I think many times I've heard people say, both in the US and in other contexts, it's not about reconciliation. We were never consigned. So it's about reimagining and transforming the the relationship, both individual, social, structural, and political and economic. And I think I was just reminded of something that um, Jennifer Taylor from the Equal Justice Initiative said at a recent panel I listened to her um, present. She noted that efforts to abolish slavery did not include any effort to abolish the dehumanizing ideas behind it. And, and I think there, when we think about the social aspects of reconciliation and what you were saying earlier about how, you know, in textbooks in, in, um, in Texas, they refer, refer to slaves as workers, as an example, um, the need to really look at all spheres and, and address the public sphere. And there, I think centering the arts, culture and storytelling as a way of starting to undo and address that dehumanized narrative that's been built into our societal fabric and open spaces for people across generations, across different experiences to create something new, I think can be really powerful. And we've seen that in Tunisia, for example, with you know, young people and older people who had different experiences, um, hadn't really engaged with each other, but we brought together a group of young leftist artists to listen to the narratives and the testimony of women who had been imprisoned for wearing a veil. And they had to then immerse themselves in that experience and think about how to represent it artistically. And they said that was the first time that they had really realized that this is what had happened to, to those women. They had never been aware of this. So they created something that led to a sort of a awakening within them. And then we heard people who went to the exhibition of these uh, pieces of art say, oh, I, didn't, I never knew about this. I, I wasn't aware this happened in my country. You know, young people sort of coming to terms with it. So I think the, the space for arts, culture, storytelling to to broaden what, what we mean by reconciliation and also just to know that reconciliation is not an end process, an end state that I think we should expect to achieve anytime soon, but it's this constant quest for reconciliation, for justice, for truth that we have to stay on and put the, the resources, the information, the tools in the hands of people to keep that, that fight on. Can I, can I add this because um, I was loving what R Rashawn and, and Virginia said uh, and you know what's interesting about the Confederacy, as um, they pointed out, is that they lost the war but won the narrative. Mm. And um, what I'm hopeful of, and I know um, there's some races out there that will certainly um, be offended by this, and um, but um, for so long you could get away with saying untruths and be seen as a credible person. With today's knowledge base, um, you sound like an outward bigot if you support um, Confederate statues. You sound crazy. I mean, you always sound crazy to me if you supported this. I just want to be clear about that. But society as a whole is is are much more educated on these issues. Large, and I will say this, largely thanks to journalists um, um, a certain segment of social scientists, and I, I'm going to exclude economists from this <laughs> conversation, um, but it, it, it has been the sociologists. It has been, to a certain degree, psychologists. It, it's been people who've understood the qualitative nature of racism to mm -hmm. then go back in history and, and, and uplift these narratives and connect them to the present. And because of that, we are much more 
and generally, generally speaking, a much more educated society on these things. And so you look crazy and buffoonish, cartoonish, um, ignorant if you are supporting a Trump. I mean, you are ignorant. I just want to be clear, you are ignorant. And just like with other areas, when you're ignorant, you fill that void with conspiracy theories, stereotypes, bad information. But now, in, I'm talking culturally speaking, in society, you look crazy. I mean, and I actually think you, you are seeing this play out as um, folks becoming very angry, very resistant, uh, backing themselves in a court and becoming very dangerous, more actually more dangerous now than ever. So I am fearful in the sense of, I do think we are at a precipice for change, no question, but there is going to be pain in the, in, in, in the near term. I, I'm because people now see that they are ignorant, that they are damaged, and they are reckoning with that. They're not necessarily wanting um, racial reconciliation, but they're like, "Am I crazy? Am I ignorant?" Yes, you are. Deal with. Um, it. I, I'm afraid we have I'm run sorry. out of time. I have a number of great, great questions. I would just like to to say a few words to conclude. Uh, the fact that we are hopefully very close to make the jump and embark in this uh, uh, endeavor once forever, um, it, it doesn't really surprise us that there is such a resistance and the resistance is becoming more visceral, more, you know, so aggressive, so, and, uh, and finds excuses not to see. Uh, you know, the, 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 there is an entire science that we have to contend with in our work, which is, you know, the narrative and the propaganda and how that plays in power sharing or power exclusion, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the things that you said, the, power, the, the progressive power shift, the growing, the emerging, um, you know, group of um, uh, Black Americans that can claim a different role in society, the number of those uh, is shifting this very delicate power sharing. And, uh, and finally, and, and obviously the reaction is uh, fear, is fear and resistance. Uh, and, and, and we have seen it, you know, we see it all, all, uh, all over. And these, uh, you know, of the many, many questions that you received that I would have loved to pose you and some to reply directly. Uh, there is one that I just would like to conclude with, which is, you know, Americans are not, but and I'm not saying it as a European, it came from the audience. Uh, Americans are not particularly known for their willingness and ability to learn from other societies. Uh, just a note to the side, transitional justice as part of the discipline of international law has been sponsored at different levels by, uh, you know, US uh, policies, uh, foreign policies. Uh, but how can we build on lesson learned in truth, reconciliation and justice processes around the world? So, so and, and I would like just to conclude uh, and ask you, uh, would you, how do you think we can contribute and how do you think we can help bringing these many different experiences in a way that is respectful to all what you have done for generations to get us here and at the same time that is useful to you? I'll, 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 I'll go continue. I just will want to thank everyone at ICTJ for hosting. This has been great. And I actually have um, a bunch of ideas for future writings that Rishon and I are going to do. Um, but I will just say this, um, Ambassador James Joseph of South Africa had a fellowship program out of, the, out of Duke University. And I got a chance to go to South Africa to study Mandela and, um, and how he organized um, in South Africa. And, um, and Roshan mentioned this, 
um, Vir Virginia does this, travel, talk to other people, immerse yourself in the other culture every once in a while. The, the knowledge you gain from talking to other people who don't look like you, maybe even the same hue, but um, from a different place is absolutely invaluable. It changes, I mean, no pun intended, it changes your worldview. So I would recommend travel and participate in some type of fellowship organization. Um, um, and if you can get sponsored, do so. I know that's a costly endeavor. I never, I never take for granted that this is a class issue. But um, if you can travel and learn from others, um, that's one of the best things you can do. Dr. Ray, anything to add before we conclude? Uh, I'll just quickly say, I mean, thank, thank you all for organizing this. Uh, Virginia, I know you, you've done so much work behind the scenes and thank you so much. This was phenomenal. Thank you for, for including us. I mean, look, Andre is exactly right. I mean, again, I think it goes back to, you know, my grandfather who traveled the world um, in the military. He was Purple Heart, Bronze Star, served 21 years, was a drill sergeant. Um, you know, when he passed away, got a commendation from uh, former President Obama. And one thing he taught me from a very young age is that our silence is our acceptance. And um, Terrence Cribs, who runs a, a museum, actually a black police museum in, in Miami, in the Miami area, he added to that and he, he said, yeah, your silence becomes your acceptance and your silence leads to someone else's oppression. And anytime when your silence leads to someone else's oppression, you have an obligation, a human obligation. Yes, your civil right, it's your human right, duty to say something. You might not always know what needs to be said, but you can interrupt that narrative. Like when Andre talked about how the Confederacy lost the war, but won the narrative, people can disrupt that narrative. And I think that's a powerful tool when we start to talk about truth and reconciliation, because at the least it disrupts falsehoods that then can lead to people exploring what the truth actually is. Well, um, I'm left with a thank you, you all, uh, for these wonderful um, conversations. My hands were twitching because I had so much to say, but it was great to hear you. And I, I really benefited from uh, having you uh, discussing uh, these issues. Lots of food for thoughts, also for Virginie and myself. Uh, for uh, follow-up work, uh, for sure, and uh, where we would be absolutely pleased to involve you. Uh, and um, with that, I thank all uh, the participants. I hope you found this discussion uh, uh, interesting, useful. Um, the paper, uh, our, our paper, The Color of Justice, is now online. So for whoever is interested, is available. And uh, we hope to continue these conversations and to involve as many people as it takes to enact change. Thank you very, very much.